sure nobody touches it. T minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition and lift off of the Atlas V with Juno on a trek to Jupiter, a planetary piece of the puzzle on the beginning of our solar system. Picture our roll program is in progress. Vehicle body rates look good. Mr. P has gone to fixed angles. Big chamber pressures have plateaued. I'm rolling off. Signatures look good. RD-180 operation looks excellent at this point. Deploy. Mach 1. SRB chambers continue to roll off.
Jupiter orbit insertion is probably one of the most important things in the entire mission, and it's because that changes us from being in orbit around the sun to being captured in orbit around Jupiter. And if you're not in orbit around Jupiter, you can't do the science we want to do. We named it Juno because that's the sister and wife of Jupiter in Roman mythology. So, you know, in mythology they did things a little bit strange. They were both the sister and the wife. But basically she was the queen of the gods and Jupiter was the king of the gods. And there was a story about how Jupiter was sort of up to no good and being mischievous and uh, saw his wife coming, Juno, and said, oh no, I better hide my mischief. And he cast a, a veil of clouds around himself to hide. And she had her own special powers and saw a hint of what was going on and then used her powers to see right through those clouds and see what Jupiter was really up to. And that's exactly what our spacecraft Juno does, is it uses secret powers, which are science instruments from a unique perspective, and we see through the clouds of Jupiter to see the true nature of Jupiter. Jupiter is the biggest, baddest planet there is. It is the monster of the solar system. And what we're learning now is, even in other solar systems, they don't always all have a monster like Jupiter. And many people think, boy, you almost need a Jupiter to have an Earth, maybe. Jupiter played a big, important role. But its environment, everything about it is extreme. It's, it's the, a planet on steroids, right? It is the most extreme in every way it can be. So it has the strongest magnetic field, the strongest gravity field. It has the most harsh radiation. It's spinning super fast. I mean, it's everything about it is this extreme environment. So I've already had a good day because we launched successfully. Um, when we arrive there and get into orbit, that's another good day. And then each orbit that we make successfully is another great day because even if we just get a couple of orbits we will have learned so much so much that we don't know now but my idea of really what I'm hoping for is to get all the orbits make a whole map of Jupiter get all the key measurements about what it's like inside how much water is in there what is its structure like and be able to walk away and say we have a data set that can really help us understand how Jupiter formed, how the other planets are made, and what the early solar system was like, how the polar magnetosphere works, what do the poles of Jupiter look like in all their glory and full color, what do the zones and belts really look like close up with incredible pictures, and what are all, what's all underneath those zones and belts, and what is underneath that great red spot, how deep does it go? and sort of just how beautiful are the aurora borealis in ultraviolet and infrared and just making that whole measurement and finally and maybe and certainly one of the most important is how does that internal magnetic field actually work what's making this giant magnetic field inside of jupiter What's it like inside of that planet to make that kind of a magnetic field? Because it's an immense energy source by itself. The major science objectives of Juno are one, to understand how Jupiter formed and what is it made out of. We want the recipe of solar systems and we're at the ingredient list level. So we're gathering the ingredient list and understanding how Jupiter is structured. So, the most important objectives are understanding Jupiter's formation and how that relates to the formation of other planets, including us. How does its polar magnetosphere work? What's driving those incredible aurora? How deep are the zones and belts? And what are the dynamics deep inside of Jupiter's atmosphere? And how is it structured inside? What is the magnetic field like? And is there a core in the middle of it? Because Jupiter is so large, 
it's changed relatively little since the beginning. It takes a lot to change Jupiter because it's so big. You drop a comet into Jupiter, it just kind of disappears inside and you haven't really done much to the planet. So Jupiter remains, in a way, pristine. Now, it's gone through some internal changes and so forth, but it's nothing like, say, looking at the Earth and trying to figure out what the Earth was like four billion years ago. For Jupiter, the changes have been a lot smaller compared to the, just the sheer size of the planet. Basically, the interior of Jupiter is nearly unexplored. What we see when we look at Jupiter and all the great, amazing stuff we've discovered about Jupiter is about the moons that orbit the planet, it's about the atmosphere and the enormous weather systems and the great red spot and belts and zones, you know, stripes across the planet, all kinds of really cool, interesting, exciting stuff, but it's kind of skin deep. When we look at Jupiter, we're going, you know, a percent or two of the way down into the planet. That's what we're really seeing. Everything else about Jupiter, the deep interior of Jupiter, is nearly completely unknown. That's what we're trying to learn about. Our four main science objectives for Juno are to understand the origin of Jupiter, how did it form, to understand the deep interior structure of Jupiter, what's it look like underneath the clouds where we can't see, to study the atmospheric dynamics of Jupiter, all that swirling motion of this giant atmosphere with belts and zones and jet streams and storms and things, and to study Jupiter's magnetosphere, the region captured by Jupiter's enormous magnetic field that fills a huge piece of the solar system. Okay, first of all, when we arrive at Jupiter, we're going way too fast to go into orbit. So we fire the main engine for 35 minutes. That slows us down so that we can get captured into orbit. Then we'll do two 53-day orbits to check out our spacecraft, check out our instruments, and see if there's any surprises that Jupiter will throw away. Then we fire the main engine one last time, and that reduces our orbit to 14 days. So now we're on a two-week cadence, and the radiation clock is ticking, uh, but we have 16 months of 14-day orbits. That's 33 orbits to get all of our science data. And then at the end, and make sure that we never hit one of the Galilean moons, they don't want us to ever contaminate it, will descend into the atmosphere and destroy the spacecraft. We call that deorbit. So we have 16 months once we get into the two-week cadence and just 16 months to get all of our data. Okay, JOI is Jupiter orbit insertion. And what it means is that when we approach Jupiter, we're going way too fast to go into orbit. If we don't do something, we'll just fly right by. So we turn the spacecraft and we fire our main engine for 35 minutes. This slows us down enough that Jupiter's massive gravity field can capture us into a 53-day orbit. So when you hear about JOI, Jupiter orbit insertion, that's what it is. There's two types of radiation we worry about. One is when we fly through the radiation belt, we get an instantaneous exposure, we call that flux. The other is flying through the radiation belt again and again and again gives us something about accumulation, we call that dose. And so in the beginning of the mission we fly largely close to the planet underneath this kind of flat donut shaped radiation belt and then we fly around it but eventually we fly more and more through the belts and our radiation levels every orbit get worse and worse and worse. We get over 80% of radiation exposure in the last half of the mission. Juno operates using solar power. We're the farthest mission ever to do that. Uh, no one's ever operated a solar powered spacecraft at Jupiter before. But there's a lot of things we had to consider when we developed those solar panels. First of all, the sunlight intensity at Jupiter is only 4% of that you'd receive at Earth. So we designed the arrays to be big enough to give us 500 watts of power despite that very low level of sunlight. A 
Juno is going to have a lot of challenges once it gets to Jupiter. Jupiter is, if you wanted to pick, aside from the sun, the scariest environment we know of to send a spacecraft to, <laughs> Jupiter would be the place to go because Jupiter has this gigantic magnetic field which traps a lot of charged particles that get accelerated along the magnetic field lines. It builds up this huge radiation field. If we were to leave our spacecraft bathing in that radiation, it's just not designed to deal with that. So we're going to go through the radiation belts to get into orbit, and then we'll be going in and out of the radiation belts as we do our science phase. From an engineering standpoint, the radiation environment at Jupiter can be damaging to the electronics, just like a radiation environment could be damaging to your cells. So to protect the electronics, we bury them inside what we call the electronics vault, which is a box of titanium, about a third of an inch thick, which is about yay big, it's pretty big, that we have our computer and all of those things inside, tucked up under our high gain antenna. Today's agenda is going through status, and today's MPST topic is the JC-63 pre-kickoff. Yes. Okay, I'll uh, start with flight software. Flight software is nominal. Thank you. Uh, GMC? GMC is nominal. Powercom? Okay. Okay. Powercom is also nominal. Batteries are steady at 31.1 volts with 77% dead charge. And no significant uh, activity on the battery this week. There was been an item added for the face to face meeting um, coming up in April um, under the JOI event. Um, added the JOI cleanup CPM that's now in the its window. The high level activities, um, background sequences 61 um, is still on board. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be doing that in US UCAL this week, as mentioned. Um, JC62 is in um, past two reviews this week. So, yes, they delivered two MPFs one for a turn burn turn and one for a vector mode PDM. I'll need to confirm with MPST uh, that they're indeed ready to present that. So, I'll send out an email later this week confirming the agenda. And then last week, I did send out a request for attendees for the ops face-to-face -face meeting. I've heard from most teams, but if you haven't responded yet, please do so. I know a couple teams were waiting to see the um, template for the instrument reports to determine who should attend for their teams, and uh, that template should be out by the end of the week. So we have the Tuesday meeting, uh, which is the science phase anomaly response. Or team planning meeting on Thursday, since we have a conflict with the MMR of the council. Okay, I think we're done. Have a good week. Bye.